Yeah, I've got a lot of credentials. I've been a lot of places and done a lot of things. Uh, I hope today I can share just a little bit with you of some of the things I've seen and done and been given by other people. Because none of us is an island unto themselves. Each one of us has something to thank, not only from God, our Creator, but from our friends and, and good people who help us and, in many cases, put up with us. Uh, all the way down at the bottom of that list of these accolades and things, continuing education, Appalachian School of Life. What does that mean? This is, you got, I'm a city boy. I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, a suburb of Washington, D.C. And I uh, started running away from the city and going to the mountains in Appalachia when I was 12 years old. My parents were pretty kind. They let me get on the road that early. But, And then I found myself this weekend in, in Appalachia. This man here is George Tasker, my father-in-law. He's a, he's a mountain man. He's a sawmill man. He raised a family of eight kids. I think most years he didn't make more than $8,000 a year. But uh, anyway, on this particular day, I think it was a Saturday, they were up there in the mountain planting potatoes. He'd open the furrows with the mule and we'd follow behind, drop in the seed potatoes. He'd come back in and plow that furrow in, cover it up. Then I came over and I was, I was walking on the road like this. And George, he says to me, he, he kind of grinned as he usually does. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm creating a firm seed bed. This was my uh, first year at the University of Maryland, so I was taking beginning crops. And of course, that was part of it. You learn you have to create a firm seed bed. And George says, that won't work here. He knew that when it rained, that rain would fall on the mountains, wash down those shallow soils to it got to the bench terraces, the few bench terraces they had to farm or garden and it, it would just saturate the soils. So they had to make sure that the, the soil was bedded, he says. And he, he didn't know, but I knew later that this was a marine soil developed on shale, and it was only about 16 inches deep. We're so blessed out here with deep soils and these mollusols. And he knew that that soil, he, as he told me, that soil's got to breathe. And that was my first lesson in microbial ecology. I went on to do a PhD at Cornell University and, and work with developing concepts in soil microbiology and biochemistry. But that one lesson from this man with a sixth grade education laid the foundation for me for the basis and fundamentals of, of life. So I call that my degree from the Appalachian School of Life. And the, the president of that school is George W. Tasker. And uh, it's, it's a continuing education process. And I should state that here in front of you today, I, I, I really feel I'm on holy ground. I'll try not to get. <laughs> you hold the key to the future as you educate our young people. And that's what we, we have to look to the future. Each one of us has that gift and that opportunity. And I appreciate everything you do every day when you're working with them, regardless of what age the students are. I don't care, kindergarten through high school, those children want to learn. And hopefully we'll teach them the right things. But thank you for what you're doing. Four threats to sustaining Earth and its people. Some people would look on these as maybe the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And some would say the end times are near. When, 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 when was the last end of the world? It was not too long ago, wasn't it? But we know, do know one thing. We do know that the Earth is going through some major adjustments. And many of these relate to the four areas or horsemen of the apocalypse, if you will. Poverty, war, environment, and, and pestilence, or health and AIDS. 
Most of these things are influenced by two major factors. Population growth, and when population growth results in people striving for adequate food and an adequate standard of living, and also our total dependence on fossil fuel and the monetary and environmental costs associated with that. One interesting thing, the, the former foreign minister of Israel, I was at a conference in Greece. It was interesting. Uh, I'm not very important, but I found myself in the company of George Bush Sr. and Yasser Arafat, the former minister of Israel. And he said one of the things we suffer from is a different type of poverty, what some would call the poverty of affluence, of always wanting more and more of things you don't really need. And these are the things that cause us problems in our world, in our cities, in our countries, and in our towns. So we have to learn to get through some of these things as we move forward into the future. When I first came out here to Nebraska, it was 1975, and I started working out at the High Plains Ag Lab at Sydney, Nebraska. My first day in the field, I think it was, and this was like in October, the end of October. It was like 85 degrees out there, and the wind must have been blowing a steady 35, 40 miles an hour. I could understand what the early settlers saw when they came to this climate environment, what they had to do to survive in this, what seemed to be a hostile environment. And during the lifetimes of many of these early settlers, they came and saw the great effects of climatic uncertainty and of our destruction with the dirty 30s, our destruction by plowing up all the prairies that had taken hundreds and thousands of years to form the soil resource. And as we move along, this picture is taken at Sydney High Plains Ag Lab. We have seen tremendous gains in agriculture, two to three fold yield increases from this industrial agriculture, but these have come at a fairly high cost and always subsidized by oil. You see the oil well pumping away there in the background. What's this over here? It's a high fence. It's got barbed wire on top of it. There's a few motion sensors around. Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah, it's a missile site. Absolutely, it's a missile site. And that whole ag experiment station, as, as this one here, were de was developed on a munitions depot. And when we think about it, most of the tools we use and the, and the technologies that were developed for war are the technologies that we utilize so much in agriculture. The Haber-Bosch process for fixation of atmospheric ammonia was developed in 1912 in preparation for World War I with the ability at a high cost of energy of fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere and producing ammonium nitrate, which was used for munitions. When I came in 1975, I was also surprised that some of the scientists here that had thought they were really improving things for the world, feeding the world, found that they were shocked to discover that feeding the world could impair the environment. And a Professor Robert Olson, I don't know how many of you know Bob Olson. He, 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 yeah. He took me down to an environmental survey one day. He says, we've got this young man down there. He needs to be straightened out. He's an Easterner and he came here and he's using this fancy technology of mass spectrometry to tell us that we've got a problem in our waters and the problem's coming from our fertilizer. And so I said, okay, well, I'll go down and talk to this guy. But don't you know, what we found out was we do have a problem. At this farm in Shelton, that farmer was putting on three acre feet of water to produce his crop. Now, he only needed one acre foot to produce the crop, but he's putting on three because water was cheap in those days. And then he was fertilizing with about 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Well, had he analyzed his water, the water at that time was 16 parts per million nitrate nitrogen. 
If you add that at three acre feet, you figure out he was always a, also applying almost 280 pounds of nitrogen per acre in the irrigation water. So there again, we see, we thought we were doing good, but we have to be careful and we have to learn how to, how to deal with nature and the environment. In China, farmers who had farmed sustainably for over 40 centuries now lose 18 pounds of farmable soil for each pound of food that they eat. And uh, I may try to have some copies for you of this book, Soil, Food, and People conference that I attended. It, <clears throat> it'll give you a lot more details and figures for these types of things. But when I was there, I took this picture in 1988. What the conservationists were concerned with, with as China was moving towards a free market economy and actually following our model for almost everything with the commercial fertilizer use and all, some of the farmers who had previously put in a third crop of a green manure cover crop like milk vetch would now not do that, but they'd go to the city in the winter and work, make money, and buy fertilizer and apply it instead of the soil conservation cover crop of milk vetch. And this is one of the consequences of that. The soils were no longer protected by that third crop and the continuous cover of soil. And traveling around the world talking about sustainability, that's kind of an oxymoron in itself. I, I see, take lots of pictures. My wife's amazed at how many pictures I'll take when we're up in an airplane. But this one surprised me. For the first time since the dawn of civilization, we now have the technological capability to change the global environment. In this up high upper atmosphere zone, which now has had the permeation of things like nitrous oxides, nitrogen oxides, helps start destroying the ozone layer. That's the very layer that makes this blanket up there that protects us from ultraviolet rays. So now some people are going to say, well, climate change, I don't know. I don't believe in that. And I agree. Geologically, we know the Earth has gone through many cycles of warming, of cooling. But I do know one thing, and I know it's supported by scientific fact is that we now have the capability and are changing the global climate. But we also have the ability to circumvent that if we don't wait too long. This scales of justice here was drawn for me by a high school math teacher. And George did a great job on it. I thought it really captured the essence of the challenge that we have in sustaining both the Earth and its people of trying to come to some balance, to meet a balance between the needs of the earth, which sustains us, and the needs of the people of the earth. And the multi, this one doesn't have so many different colored people, but people of all types, colors, and shapes that have needs, and we need to find some way to balance those things. I took over the editorship of a journal, it was American, formerly called the American Journal of Alternative Agriculture. Well, I thought that was a terrible title. Uh, not that I'm non-patriotic or not a patriot, but I, I just didn't think America had all the answers for everything. And also, I don't think our agriculture should be an alternative. It has to be a management system that's going to give us everything we need to meet our food and production needs and maintain the quality of our essential soil, air, and water resources. Sustainable agriculture is something that's hard to capture. It's a, it's a moving target. I like this definition by Richard Harwood from uh, Michigan State University. It's, it's not a static thing. Sustainable agriculture is an agriculture that can change, it can evolve that gives us greater human utility, gives us greater efficiency of resource use, and a favorable balance with the environment. 